Good afternoon, Facebook Live. This is Robin Kirby Ghetto. Welcome to today. It is New Year's Eve. Oh my goodness. I am so super excited and I cannot wait to tell you today's message because it was it's filled with excitement and expectation. And God is just going to strengthen you and bring you courage in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so as you join on, you be hopeful and expectant. He has given me a word for 2021, and I just cannot wait to share this word with you. God gave me a dream last night, and he started right before I got on Facebook Live. God was speaking to me, and he said, Robin, say this, say that. This is what's going to happen in 2021. And I am just super excited, amen. And I see Deborah, I see Margaret Holt. I love you two women. And those are two women that I have done and still do with Margaret. Individual coaching and both women do group coaching. So please contact me. We're starting out with group coaching sessions again. And we'll be on session 16 as it relates to mindfulness, the mind of Christ Jesus. We're looking at the self-image being transformed from glory to glory. Amen. And so I'm so super excited about what this year brings. As you join on, you be expectant because I truly believe that God is just going to bring us such bounty in this upcoming year. Amen. And I just cannot wait to share what the Lord has given me to pour out upon each and every one of you. Hey, Kim Mitchell, I love you. So good to see you. Amen, Margaret. Hey, Amber Tucker. So awesome to have you on here. And so I'm going to pull out a couple things. Holy Spirit's telling me more to pull up. Like, if I do not already have enough, Holy Spirit's wanting me. Glory to God. I'm so glad Holy Spirit told me to get this one. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. God is going to have to buckle me down to this seat because I truly want to get up and I just want to run around this apartment. I am just that excited. Amen. So let us get started into this broadcast. And again, listen, I understand that you can be anywhere at this moment, that you can be doing anything. And I count it a privilege that you are on this broadcast and joining in. So let me go ahead and get started in prayer. God, we thank you for the strength of your holy name. We thank you, God, that you have favored us through your son, Christ Jesus, who has reconciled us to, uh, to you through the ministry of reconciliation, Colossians 1, and that, God, you have chosen us as that Romans 9, 23, vessel of mercy, hallelujah, that is created for your glory. And God, I thank you that you are leading us through the open door that Jesus has opened wide open and no man can shut. And that you cause us, God, to have eyes to see and ears to hear, which you are leading us by the Spirit of the Lord God. And that we are sons and daughters of God as we are led by the Spirit in Jesus' name. Oh my goodness, like I said, I'm trying to restrain myself. Because I want to get up. I'm so excited about what God keeps telling me. Now, understand, I have great experience having been a teacher of the Word ever since 2004 and having been a full-time minister since 2011. Hey, Sue Gailey, I love you. And I know and I've realized it and I try to guard against it myself because I'm just aware of our fragility, our frailty. And I know that we're human. And so I try not to preach messages that God is just working with me only. And it's not a message that is to be out there to the audience. But it is where I am with the Lord and what he's doing with me personally. And I've seen other people, Christians, ministers, that have that tendency. Hey, Chastney, God bless you. To preach what God is only dealing with that person on. He's not dealing with the congregation. <clears throat> He's not dealing with those that are listening out that are listening to that minister, to that teacher. But he is dealing with that one person. And so 
I just preface this broadcast to let you know that I truly believe that this is not just for Robin, but this is for the church. And I understand that one of the anointings that God has given me because of having that background as a psychotherapist, having a background with a law degree, I have always known that one of the grace anointings that I carry is Isaiah 9-7. And I actually did that scripture about a week ago last week, leading up to the time of the celebration that we just experienced at Christmas, which we celebrate the love of God through Jesus Christ, the Son, as we should celebrate every day. But there's just a greater receptiveness to the lost, to those that are in need, to that message at that time of year through the church. As we are a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden, we are that light of Christ Jesus, Isaiah 61, where we arise and shine. And then Isaiah 60, verse 2, he brings all nations to the brightness of that rising. Amen. Because we're exalting Christ Jesus. And so this message that I am bringing you today is from that voice of the Father of Isaiah 9, 7. Because remember, wherever the Lord of hosts is present in Scripture, wherever the Spirit of the Lord is in Scripture, it is always about the message, the message, the message. And so I truly believe, as God has had me preaching about judgment coming to the house of God in the last four Facebook Lives, I believe, God has brought such a grace, an anointing by the Spirit of the Lord, as revealed in Isaiah 61, which I did two broadcasts ago, and it was the day of vengeance of our God, the acceptable year of the Lord, where Jesus unrolls the scroll, and we see him speak this in Luke, the Gospel of Luke, where the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he has anointed me, and we see this in Scripture in Isaiah 61.1, of course, and Luke 4.18, where Jesus has unrolled the scrolls, and he is reading this, and he says, in this, that this scripture is performed in your midst, right before you. And so, that is the Spirit of the Lord. It is about the message. So, the message was given in the time of Isaiah, where the prophet writes the expression of the Spirit of the Lord that has been given to him as he writes the Father's heart, the Father's intention, that there's a time of oppression against his people, but there is a day that is coming. It is appointed, and it is appointed at a certain time, and that when that day comes, the day of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord is poured out and given unto his people in great measure, and we see this also demonstrated in Joel 2, and that the message by the anointing, woo! Say it in Jesus' name. Grace, hallelujah. That the anointing is on the message and it destroys yokes of oppression. And I love the visual that God gave me probably about almost two decades, probably about 18 years ago. God gave me this vision. And this is what I always talk about. And it goes with the scripture he has today that he just told me to look up. And so I know, I know, I know a lot of people know the scripture and you've heard it, that the anointing destroys. It breaks the yoke of oppression. That's Isaiah 10, 27. And the visual that God gave me is he showed me, and it's also revealed in Scripture, I think it's Isaiah 62, where oppressiveness from the enemy is like a, a, a yoke upon the net. Jesus' yoke is easy and light. It is not a burden. Well, God showed me as the enemy tries to get a chokehold upon our person in the spirit and tries to put fetters on our feet, hey, Tricia, that the anointing of the anointed one, Christ Jesus, by the power of Holy Spirit, the word of God, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free, John 8, 32, that the anointing swells up and it just breaks that yoke of oppression and that is one of the visuals, the analogies that has always stuck with me that greater is Christ Jesus in you than he that is in this world. 
So let's look at the message that God keeps telling me over this next year. And as I did about two broadcasts ago, 1 Peter 4, 17. Now remember, I brought in John 17, 17, and I explained how 17 represents consecration. And again, I don't go by dream journals. I don't go by number books. I'm not into numerology. I don't look for the meaning of numbers. It just falls in my lap, and God just speaks to me through Scripture as it relates to a specific number. So John 17, 17, I explained, talks about our consecration through Christ Jesus, the Word, who is truth, and that He consecrates us, the Word, in truth. Amen. And so it, it's odd. My nose is just running for some reason. I don't know why. It's odd and it's amazing at the same time how 1 Peter 4, 17, which means consecration, talks about the judgment of God coming to his house. It comes to his house, what, first. And so the dream that God gave me last night and what I'm going to bring into scripture is absolutely going to blow your mind. Because on my heart, I just feel such a witness of God's strength that 2021 is the year that the victim will be the victor. Now, you're probably saying, Robin, wait a minute. I'm not a victim. You might not think that you are. You might have forgotten about areas in your life where the enemy has attacked you, where the enemy has oppressed you, and you've forgiven, and you've moved forward, and you've given everything over to God, and you have released people of their debts. And we know that mercy triumphs over judgment. And listen, let me just preface this by saying, do not think I am a perfect person. Some of y'all know me, and you know I am not. I'm very transparent. And because of that transparency, God uses me. So do not think that I do not need deliverance. I do. I'm all, we're going to need deliverance until Christ Jesus comes because there's only one perfect man. The Son of God, Son of Man, Jesus Christ. And we are in a process in our soul of working out our salvation in fear and trembling. Ephesians 2. Work out your salvation in fear and in trembling. Philippians 2. I always say Ephesians. Philippians 2.12. And so God has shown me that mercy does triumph over judgment But God will call people to repentance like he did Israel for many, many years. He will extend a pleading for repentance. But if they do not repent, his judgment is his mercy because he cares more about that soul than he does about them blindly staying in sin, staying in deceit, And so he brings judgment and that, hopefully, in Jesus' name, opens their eyes. Hey, Sheila, I love you. And so what we're going to see today is areas which you have overcome in great measure that this year God showed me. It is going to be like that of Hannah. When Hannah writes her praise in 1 Samuel 2, and I've done a whole workbook, and it's the next Watchman's workbook, work, the next Watchman's book that's going to come out when I do another Watchman's book. And I wrote a workbook back in 2015, 2016, and it was based on Hannah. It was based on Hannah, on 1 Samuel 1, 1 Samuel 2, and it was called 1 Samuel 2 8. Can you handle the truth? That was the name of the book because all my Watchmen's book first have a scripture that God gives me and then he gives me a theme. So that particular book, workbook, was titled 1 Samuel 2, 8. Can you handle the truth? And he confirmed it a gazillion times everywhere I went when I did that particular conference and that Watchmen's book. And this is what God told me right before this broadcast. He said, Robin, this is the year that is like Hannah. As the adversary, the enemy, Eli, and his sons were exposed to the light, where judgment came to the house of God, and those who had been the victims, 
those who had been oppressed, although Hannah had forgiven them, that God had an appointed time where all of a sudden Hannah is lifted to a state of nobility. And I, that's why I love 1 Samuel 2, 8. And we'll get to that in a moment. But that there is an exposure of the enemy that has preyed upon them and that has come against them. Hey, Andrea. And so let's look at, we're going to look at a couple scriptures and we're going to look at 1 Samuel and then we're going to look at also some more scriptures as it relates to what God is going to do in 2021. And understand that this might not be for everyone that is out there. I understand that. I see people put out stuff that they believe is for 2021 and it just does not bear witness to me for what God has as my portion. And so I just move forward and I seek what the Lord is speaking to me and what he has for me. And so when judgment comes to the house of God, if you've seen the last four broadcasts, you understand that when his judgment is for you, it's in your favor. It's a decision for you that as we see with Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord comes and it brings the message and that peace of shalom within your person as that word in Hebrew means restoration, restitution, being made whole. Oh my goodness. I want to run around. I've got chills all over me. Restitution, restoration, and being made whole. And we're going to see this through Hannah's story. And again, God keeps telling me that 2021 is the acceptable year of the Lord, that anointing of the Spirit of the Lord. And you're going to see those that were victims that are going to be victors. Amen. Hey, Liz Rodriguez. So let's look at 1 Samuel. And we're going to look at 1 Samuel 1. And I want to get to the part where Hannah is oppressed by Peninnah, her husband's other wife that has barren much children. And Hannah looks cursed. She looks like she's distressed of Saul, which she is. But she's really the victim of a system that is put in place that's made the opinion that Hannah is cursed. When she's not, she's blessed. Because according to Deuteronomy 12, with the blessings of the Lord, his blessings upon the womb is that it will be opened up and it will have children. So according to that text, people that look at Hannah might look at her and think, oh my goodness, she is just cursed. Oh, God has left her. He is not for her. And so a corrupt mindset that only sees the word of the God th through law. And it doesn't see it through the eyes of grace. The anointing is going to make ungodly judgments. And it's going to judge people. And it's going to make those judgments against them. Which are not true. And we see the necessity of the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 6 as he's brought into a place of humility. He's brought into a place of humility and he's humbled and he sees the glory of God filling the house and the seraphim are shouting and the thresholds and the foundations of the temple shake at the shouts of the voice of the seraphim who cry out. And the prophet says, Oh, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I'm, I'm, I'm among a people of unclean lips. And then God touches, gets a seraphim to touch the coal to Isaiah's lips. And he says, Your sin is removed. And then we see the sending out of God. He sends the prophet out. He sends them to the remnant. Isaiah 6.13 but the remnant is going to look just like the state in a way as it relates to looking cursed. They're going to look 
like those that are weeds who are going through trials and tribulations. The remnant is going through trials and tribulations. And so when we see this displayed, the prophet's own eyesight, his own ears have to be transformed. By how? Through love. Where he judges, as in Isaiah 11, 3 through 4, as it's prophesied about Messiah, he will not judge by his eyes or his ears, but with righteous judgments, he will distribute equity to the poor, to the downtrodden, to the meek. Hallelujah. And that's what we're going to get into. And that by the rod, he will smite the oppressor and the breath of his lips, he will what slay wickedness. So it's about the message. It's about the anointing. And so that's what's happening in this hour is there is going to be such grace made known to you, Ephesians 1, 17 and 18, where the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of wisdom, and the spirit of understanding are poured out to open the eyes of your heart so that that light of truth floods your heart and that that anointing swells up and it destroys the yoke of oppression on you. And according to the measure that you walk in that freedom, is the drink offering that you can be for other people of living waters as the Spirit of the Lord comes forth, Holy Spirit, as rivers of living water. Amen. So let's look at Hannah in 1 Samuel 1. So verse 9, after she's been vexed. And where has she been vexed? At the place of worship. At the house of God. At the temple of God. She's been vexed there. She hasn't been vexed outside. She's been vexed there at the place of worship by Peninnah, where she's talking about Hannah not having any children, Hannah looking cursed. But we have to understand that there is an appointed season where the Spirit of the Lord comes, where grace comes, and you turn from victim to victor. And Hannah means grace. Amen. So let's look at verse 9 of 1 Samuel 1. So Hannah rose after they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on his seat beside a post of the temple, the tent of the Lord. And Hannah was in distress of soul. She was praying to the Lord and weeping bitterly. And this is where I tell people, listen, God can handle your complaints of where your heart is, not you just complaining to complain and whining to whine. And in that pity spirit, this is not where Hannah is. The justice, as I talk about in Healing of the Soul, with justice at the dung gate, which I mentioned last week, I think it's session seven of Healing of the Soul, where I've talked about Satan's gone and dung it again. It's the dung gate of Jerusalem in the book of Nehemiah. And justice comes within Hannah, the Spirit of the Lord, that this is not to be her condition, that she's not a victim. So within her members, in her person, justice is crying out, and her mind cannot comprehend, wait a minute, why does Peninnah, who seems to be wicked, why does she seem to be blessed, and I'm just distressed, and I look cursed? And it's the Spirit of God. It's grace coming upon Hannah, the anointing. And it is breaking off the oppression of her old season that she's a victim, even though she's forgiven, but it is moving her into the manifestation of hope. Zechariah 9, 12, return to the prison of hope, for God will, just, God will restore to you double your former prosperity. See, God has a stronghold of hope that he moves us into in that place of affliction. Amen. So let's look at scripture. And Hannah rose. Hannah was in distress of soul, praying to the Lord and weeping bitterly. That's verse 10, 1 Samuel 1. She vowed saying, O Lord of hosts. Now remember what I told you. Whenever the Lord of hosts, like I, I've, say, I've said this for years, and I'm going to keep saying it for years. Whenever you see, neon sign, the Lord of hosts, get this in your knower, in scripture, whenever you see the spirit of the Lord, in scripture, it's about the message. 
when the Lord of hosts shows up in Judges 5, in Isaiah 6, in Psalm 24, when the Lord of hosts shows up to Ezekiel, and she is crying out to the Lord of hosts. So what's she crying out for? The message that's to be distributed within her members, the glory of God, the kabod, the weightiness, the copiousness, the peace, hallelujah, amen. So let's look at verse 11. She vowed saying, a Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your handmaid and earnestly remember and not forget your handmaid, but will give me a son, I will give him to the Lord all his life, and no razor shall touch his head. And she continued praying before the Lord. And Eli noticed her mouth. Now Eli represents the old system. Eli means I will ascend. And when I was doing the workbook about five years ago, this is when God told me. He said, Robin, look how many times Eli is in scripture. And I looked and it was 33 times. And he said, it means I will ascend. Who does that sound like? It sounds like Lucifer in Ezekiel 28. In Ezekiel, in Isaiah 14, we see Lucifer wanting to ascend to the hill of the Lord. I will ascend to the hill of the Lord. And this is what I will ascend. Uh, I will ascend. Let me put it in. I will ascend to the Most High. Isaiah 14, 14. I will ascend to the Most High. So we see Lucifer exalting himself. He's exalting himself. And God said, Robin, that is just like with Eli. And I said, oh my goodness. And then that's when God showed me that 33 meant anointing. And that's when I do that entire teaching in that workbook five years ago of 1 Samuel 2, 8. Can you handle the truth? Because let me tell you what, saints of God, the truth is going to visit your temple with such a grace of God as we move into this year. And there's such a boldness in the faith where God has stirred up holiness within your members that you have the gift of faith and an expectation that God is going to move on your behalf. Amen. And so that's what we're seeing with Hannah. 1 Samuel, 2, 1 Samuel 1, verse 12. And as she continued to pray before the Lord, Eli noticed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. And that is like uh, Psalm 19 about the stars. So Eli thought she was drunk. Eli said to her, How long will you be intoxicated? Put that wine away from you. Now understand, Eli represents those that have been deceived and given over to that of Lucifer with pride. And I'm going to bring in my dream later. And they've given up to the things of pride. And so deception has taken over their hearts. And their judgments are not just, they're not right. But they have flattering lips and proud tongues that are arrogant that speak two different things. And so Eli represents that deception that is in God's house. And he's speaking against Hannah, who has become the victim of an ungodly system. And God is about to flip it. And he's about to show grace on the downtrodden, the meek, the humble. And he's bringing judgment to his house and those that have exalted themselves, they're about to find out they're going to be on the other end of this judgment. And it's just going to flip because God exalts the humble. Amen. God exalts the humble. I love giving you all these scriptures. God exalts the humble. And that is Psalm 138.6, Proverbs 3.34, Proverbs 29.23, Matthew 23.12, and many more. I mean, I just want to give you scriptures because it's all about scriptures. So let's look further. But Hannah answered, Hannah answered, No, my Lord. No, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. She's grieved. And God's taken her through the process because justice 
by Holy Spirit says this is not your portion. Your portion, according to Deuteronomy 12, is to be blessed. Your portion is not to be cursed. Amen. But understand, hallelujah, that the trial comes to prove the motive. And we see this in Psalm 105, 16 through 19 with Joseph, that God sent a man before the famine, and God sent him in chains and shackles and fetters, and his soul enters the fetters, that his identity becomes his trial until, until, woo, hallelujah, the Spirit of the Lord, the Lord of hosts, until the word of the Lord had tried and tested him. And so we are in the midst of trials, and it's so the word of God is trying and testing us so that when, hallelujah, the appointed time, the Spirit of the Lord, hallelujah, comes upon that message, we have been visited within our members with a King of glory, Psalm 24, who is strong and mighty, woo, in battle, hallelujah, where now you once were a victim and you're the victor, hallelujah, because you have what? Clean hands and a pure heart. Amen. So let's look at verse 16. Regard not your handmaid as wicked woman. See, people see what they want to see. If they have wickedness in their heart, they're going to project that on you. And as a psychotherapist, I've seen that many times in therapy, and it's called projection. But God told me plainly, Robin, People, he told me this many, uh, almost two decades ago, and he said, just to prepare me for persecution, he said, Robin, people see what they want. They want to see evil in you. They want to see demons on you because they have evil in their heart. They have demons oppressing them. And we see this demonstrated with Eli, and he's totally deceived. And his sons are sleeping with women in the house of God. They're going around fornicating. And they're about to meet the judgment of God. And God is about to flip everything over and exalt the humble and bring down the proud. Amen. So verse 18, Hannah said, and then Eli said, go in peace. Now remember, I taught a week ago that God's vengeance is peace, P-E-A-C-E. And in Hebrew, the root word means restitution, restoration, being made whole. That means, let me just put this into perspective for you. <laughs> because if somebody has committed a criminal activity against you, you take them to criminal court first. And if that same person has caused distress, has caused things to be bad for your situation, in order to get payment for that mental anguish, for doctors, for all the things that you can prove by bills that you've paid, either to a therapist or to a hospital, when you take them to what? Civil court. Civil court is where you get payment for what the defendant, the criminal, did against your person. So when you look at peace, it is all of a sudden, God has brought the criminal court and the civil court to hear your case, and he is going to come against the enemy and expose the criminal activities, and at the same time, hallelujah, pay you restitution and recompense. Is that not amazing? And that is peace. That is shalom. That is the judgment of God. So the family rose early. And verse 18, Hannah said, let your handmaid find grace in your sight. So who's she asking grace? Who's she asking for favor in front of? The enemy who has misjudged her. God will cause your enemies to be at peace with you and God will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies and as she went to the table 
to get food at the house of worship. And Peninnah attacked her and vexed her. Now, God is about to prepare a banquet table, hallelujah, for Hannah in front of Peninnah and Eli. Is that not amazing? And so the family, Hannah, verse 18, said, Let your handmaid find grace in your sight. So she went her way and ate. Her countenance was no longer sad. Do you see this? Because she got the breakthrough. Whatever is inside of here is going to show here. You cannot hide it. You cannot hide the glory of God. It's seen on the face. It's light. Amen. Just like Jesus said, that let the light that is in you not be darkness. Let it be that light. And I see it and have seen it many times as I've looked at people and God's just opened my eyes by the spirit of discernment. And I will see the shape of their figure like a brilliant light coming around them. And sometimes it's like this, sometimes like this, and it will go around their person. And at the same time, I've seen a dark light that looks like a dark black fog around a person. And we have to understand whatever is in the temple is in this deep place. Genesis 1, 1 through 3, as I talk about in Healing of the Soul Session 1, the light, Whatever is brooding in a deep place, as it talks about on the face of the waters, is seen in the face, the countenance of us. So Hannah, at this point, has received grace. And Hannah, we saw in verse 19, the family rose early the next morning and worshiped before the Lord. So her countenance has changed. She's no longer the victim. She's the victor. However, Peninnah doesn't see it, but Hannah sees it in her heart, amen, that she's a victor. So verse 19, the family rose early the next morning, worshiped before the Lord, and returned to their home in Ramah. Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her, and Hannah became pregnant in due time and named him Samuel, which means heard of God, heard of God, because she said, I asked him of the Lord. And God answered her. Okay, now this is what we're going to see. We're going to look at a couple things in 1 Samuel 1 to understand. Now, Peninnah, the Hebrew name Peninnah, it actually comes from two Hebrew words. The first word and then a root word. The two meanings we get from Peninnah, who vexed her, is to look at from a different angle and pearl. And of course... God brought to mind about the pearl of great price. The pearl of great price and the scripture as it relates to the pearl of great price in the gospel. I'm just pulling up everything because I want to make sure you have scripture. Is Matthew 13, 45 through 46. And this is what God told me. He said, Robin, you have to understand your trials are for a purpose. It's sifting out that which is unclean unholy in our person. It's pruning us. Amen. It's burning up the chaff. And also, it's causing us to look at things from a different angle so that we get the pearl of great price. So that we get the treasure of Jesus Christ, the anointed one. Amen. So we're going to look at a, fir- a couple things here in First Samuel 1 just to bring you understanding. So when we look at scripture, as I mentioned, Penina, and it comes from one word that means, as, as the meaning as I'm, I mentioned, it means jewel, it means pearl, and it also means to look at from a different angle. But let's look at a couple of things as God brings understanding to our person so we can rejoice at the wisdom that he brings from above, James 1, 6, pours it out liberally and causes us to rise up. Isaiah 60, verse 1, arise above the place of prostration 
and depression in which your circumstances have kept you. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God woo, has risen upon you. That's what's happening in Hannah's person. That is grace. Amen. And so let's look at Isaiah, 1 Samuel 1. And I'm going to look at Ramah with a place where they're from. And it means heal. And it actually comes from a word that means place of worship, a high place. And I love this because the high worship, the high praise is hallelujah. And that's high praise unto God. And so God is taking her to a greater place of worship. What is that? We see this in John 4. John 4, with the Samaritan woman who was in a low estate until she met the one, Jesus, who provides living waters, that those that worship God must worship Him in what? Spirit and in truth. John 4, 24. Oh my goodness, Psalm 24. That is the Spirit of the Lord. That is the Lord of hosts, the King of glory. Is that not phenomenal? And so this hill, Ramah, represents Psalm 24. It represents worshiping God in spirit and in truth because you've put it on the altar. Your circumstances, what's happened to you, you've given it to God. And although others might look at you and think you're a victim, in this hour you're about to be a victor. And God's promises are yes and amen. Now understand, I know some of you are discouraged, and I do not know your season. I do not know your trying and the perfecting of God's word that's taking place in you. So as we see with David, with Joseph, we see 14 years for that perfecting in that place where they just feel that they're not going to make it and their soul just keeps getting downcast. So understand, I do not know where each and every one of you are. I know where I am with God, where he's showing me and how he's pruning me, how he's removing the unclean out of my members and how he's preparing me to walk as a victor. Amen. So let's also look at a couple of other things on here where God is going to have us look at Elkanah, her husband. Elkanah means God has possessed. God has created. God has obtained. Amen. So this is that anointing of Holy Spirit upon your person. And let's look at Ramah and Elkanah in that place where God is bringing us by the Spirit of the Lord. As I love to tell people when God leads me, because a lot of people do not know Holy Spirit and understand Holy Spirit at a greater depth. And when I preach, when I teach, when the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, the only way I can say it is I am possessed by Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of people talk about being possessed by demons, but you don't hear them talking about being possessed by Holy Spirit. And this same term, as it relates to Elkanah, represents possessed. It represents create. So what does that make us think of? Adam. God created Adam. So God breathed into Adam and God possessed Adam. Do you see this, saints of God? This is that new creation, that fresh anointing, Psalm 92.10, that new anointing. It is as in Micah 4.13, which I've written about in great detail. In Rev 22.2, it is that wild ox anointing where you've been on that threshing floor and then he lifts you up on the threshing floor and he brings the enemy under your feet like sheaves. Amen. So let's look at a couple things that God keeps leading me. I just realized that time is getting away. So this is where God showed me what to bring to you. Are you ready? He says in 2021, his judgment is coming to his house. And those that have been preyed upon, 
by the wicked that God is bringing judgment. He's going to expose it. And he's going to make those that have been victims, victors. And it's going to be manifested. We see this expressed in Isaiah 54. Amen, Amy. We see it expressed in Isaiah 54, where all of a sudden God says, Enlarge the curtains of your habitation, lengthen your cords, and strengthen your stakes. And we also see in verse 4, No longer shall you remember the reproach of your widowhood, no longer shall you remember shame. Where does he say this as well in scripture? Joel 2. He says to Joel 2, you shall forget shame. You shall seriously no longer remember shame. Remember this week, God's been having me say, shame is the culprit. And it's getting us to compare ourselves against an imaginary person of who we could have been or think we could have been when it's the enemy behind it. Are getting us to compare ourselves to others. And God says shame is the culprit. Break agreement with it. That's what he keeps telling me. That's for some of y'all out there. Well, this is what he gave me. And it is so appropriate. Because he says you're going to see his bounty. Those that have been separated. You're going to see God's bounty this year. And that is Psalm 6511. Psalm 6511. And scripture says, you crown the year. Oh my goodness. And God had me put up a video, a picture of a little girl putting on a crown. And it's so appropriate for this. And I'm just going to have to find it and put it up again. You crown the year with your bounty and goodness and the tracks of your chariot wheels drip in fatness. Does that not totally blow your mind. I feel the anointing all over that. In fact, we're going to read all of Psalm 65. This is a Psalm, Psalm, Psalm 24, Psalm 65. Let me read this Psalm because I want to get into the dream and then we're going to end it with prayer. Amen. And celebration. Psalm 65 verse 1. To you belongs silence, the submissive wonder of reverence, which bursts forth into praise. That's that high praise. And praise is due and fitting to you, O God in Zion. And to you shall the vow be performed. Oh my goodness, Lisa Coburn's on here. What I've been teaching you happened for her. It happened the other day. I'm seeing this. I'm telling you there's an anointing on this word. Those that have been victims and preyed upon, you're about to be victors. And God is going to prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Let me get to verse 2. Oh, you who hear prayer. This is Psalm 65. To you shall all flesh come. Iniquities and much very guilt prevail against me. Yet, as for our transgression, you forgive and purge them away. Make atonement for them and cover them out of your sight. Blessed, happy, fortunate to be envied is the man whom you choose and cause to come near, that he may dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied woo, with the goodness of your house, your holy temple, glory to God, by fearful and glorious things that terrify the wicked, but make the godly saying praise. Is this not what's happening in, with Hannah in 1 Samuel 1, do you answer us in righteousness, rightness and justice, O God of our salvation? You who are the confidence and hope. Remember Zechariah 9, 12, the stronghold, the prison of hope. Of all the ends of the earth and of those far off on the seas, who by your might have founded the mountains. Woo, the hills being girded with power. Who steal for the roaring of the seas, the roaring of the waves, and the tumult of the peoples. This is the praise going up to God. That the seas are praising Him. And the people's praise sounds like the oceans, the roaring of the seas. So that those, verse 8, who dwell in the earth's farthest parts are afraid of nature's signs of your presence. You make the places where mourning crying 
and even having birth to shout for joy. Look at that. You make the places where morning and evening. He's about to no longer allow you to be a victim, but you're going to be a victor. That God makes the places where morning and evening, and I know it's the rising of the sun and the setting of the sun, but I also think about M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. That's what came to me, even though it's M-O-R-N-I-G. I just think about morning, that weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning because I see that in this verse. So that those who dwell in the earth's farthest parts are afraid of the signs of your presence. You make the places where morning and evening have birth to shout for joy. Is that not what's happening with Hannah when she gets Samuel? You visit the earth and saturate it with water. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide them with grain. That's the hundredfold harvest. Woo! You provide them with grain. When you have so prepared the earth, you're, you water the fields, the furrows abundantly. You settle the ridges of it. You make the soil soft with showers, blessing the sprouting of its vegetation. Here it is, verse 11. You crown the year with bounty and goodness. Remember, God is just having to say he is good. He's working all things to our good. You crown the year with bounty and goodness and the tracks of your chariots. They drip with fatness. That's the anointing. Woo! The luxuriant pastures in the uncultivated country dip with moisture and the hills guard themselves with joy the meadows are clothed with flocks and the valleys are also covered with grain this is the hundredfold harvest mark 4 19 and 20. they shout for joy and they sang together understand that when god brings the anointing in scripture as in in mark 4 in the core parable of the sower seed he says some yield on that good soil some 30-fold, some 60-fold, and some 100-fold. And that's what we're seeing. That hundred, that fold is the anointing. Amen? And so this was my dream. As I mentioned it and I read about it on Facebook, I was in a congregation, in a church, in a ministry, and there were just trying to deceive the congregants and to get the money. It was all about the money. And there was a minister that I know that left probably back in 2006, 2005 because of immorality. And a church that I had been in probably, it was the church that I was persecuted in. It was this church. And a minister that had left because of immorality. And in that immorality, it just brought shame and it exposed the enemy and his operation. And... In the dream, this minister was a combination of him and Bob Barker. The price is right. Oh, my goodness. The price is right. And he was dressed like Bob Barker, and he had a microphone, and he was trying to get the congregants money. And then all of a sudden, people are pouring in money into the church, into the ministry. And then it shifts. The people leave. And then I'm in this boardroom. And in this boardroom are all the ministers of that ministry that God wanted me to see. And they're still doing this entertainment mindset. And they're, if the price is right, they're willing to sell their soul. They've sold their soul just like Eli sold his soul. And he was blind to the right out sin. His own sons were committing in the church. And just read 1 Samuel 1. Read 1 Samuel 2 because I don't have enough time. And then all of a sudden, God gave me a hundredfold. And then he, he gave me a boldness. And I'd been a victim in this place as well as other people. And I know there's some people on this broadcast that have also experienced this persecution or victimization. And it's very much like what Hannah went through. And so all of a sudden... God has me just crying out to them and pleading and telling them that there's pride. There's pride and they need to humble themselves. And they resist it. They mock it. And then all of a sudden, the judgment of God comes to that house and he brings a decision for me. 
and God is exposing the tactics of the enemy. And God just began to speak to my heart. Now understand, I have forgiven. And I still look at and examine my heart to make sure and to pray for those that have persecuted me just to make sure that Robin's heart is right. And the whole purpose of this message is not to focus on me. It's not to focus on that. But it's to show you that the wicked that have been in God's house and have prayed upon like Eli, like his sons, have had the tactics of the enemy because of pride that has been exalted, that God is about to flip it over. And those that have been humble, like Jesus gives in that parable that have been standing against the wall, he's about to bring to the table. And he's about to remove those that have been preying upon others, that have been victimizing others, and he is not going to allow it to happen. It's going to be exposed. He is not going to tolerate it anymore. It is a new season. So saints of God, for those that are, of you that are out there that might not have gone through that, for you, God is speaking about such a grace of his hundredfold harvest of his word, just as it is for those that have been victimized. God is talking about a grace of his word that causes you to be circumspect, that causes you to be prudent and to have wisdom. And I love to think about this as God continually brings this scripture to my mind. And it's Daniel 12, 3. That is one of the things I prayed for the Lord for many, many years God, let me be one of those of Daniel 12, 3, that those that win many to righteousness will shine like the stars and they will shine forever. And that's the countenance of God in and upon him, them, the spirit of the Lord, grace. And what is interesting, and I posted a picture of it on one of my posts, what was interesting on Christmas day when I was visiting my parents, Rich and I came out, we left, and right there, right by my parents' yard, right there on the road, was a tag, G-R-A-C-3-3. G-R-A-C-33, and I'm sure it meant somebody's name like Gracie. But all I could see was Grace 33, the anointing. Hallelujah. And I truly believe the encouragement of the Lord for you is to know that you're going to have such grace. As Hannah talked about in 1 Samuel 2, 8, that he lifts those that have been poor and needy. In fact, we just have to read it because I don't want to summarize it. I want to give it justice by reading it. And this is where we'll end. 1 Samuel 2, 8. Can you handle the truth? Woo! 1 Samuel 2, 8. He raises up the poor out of the dust and lifts up the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with nobles and inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. Saints of God, just as God has created the pillars of this earth, he also created the pillars of his first church through the apostles being founded upon Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. And God is raising pillars in his church in 2021 who have been in the ash heap, who have been misjudged, misunderstood, but oh my goodness, who have been given the anointing woo, and been crowned with the glory of God where it shall bring his bounty in Jesus' name. And I just pray the favor of God be upon you. I pray the Lord bless you. He keep you. He shine his face upon you. He be gracious to you. He turn his face towards you and give you peace. And his name is on your forehead. And he blesses you indeed. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I love you.